Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Gunther Gooding DEI Lecture Series sponsored by the Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing. We are absolutely excited that you have chosen to join us this morning. If you need to get a copy of the program, you can all go ahead and scan that if you have not with your phones. So anybody who hasn't scanned for the program yet, I'll give you one minute uh, for both uh, in person and for those who are virtual. We're trying to go paperless, save a few trees. All right. So we are here for the Gunther Gooding DEI lecture series. If you are not here for that, you are in the wrong place. <laughs> Um, but if you happen to be in the wrong place, stay, because this is going to be absolutely amazing. So you just might have lucked up. And I'll tell you more about our amazing speaker uh, uh, later. So I start all our presentations from, from my office with this quote. Of all forms of inequity, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane, which is a quote by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and it helps to ground the work that we do and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social health justice. It reminds us that as healthcare professionals and future healthcare professionals, that our work is yet not done. All right. I am Dr. Sheldon Fields. I am the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion and a research professor here in the Ross and Carol Neese, uh, College of Nursing. Recruited to an inaugural position in our college in October of 2020 at the very height of the pandemic by our current dean, Dean Badzik. One of the other things we always do from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we need to acknowledge that like most large land grant universities and institutions, Penn State sits on indigenous land, unseated, so I'm going to read for you the Penn State University's acknowledgement of land. The Pennsylvania State University campuses are located on the original homelands of the Erie, Adonishani, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscarora, Lenape, Delaware, Shawnee, Ascenti, Easton, Oklahoma, Swazaznak, and Swazazi Osage Nations as a land-grant institution we acknowledge and honor the traditional caretakers of these lands and strive to understand and model their responsible stewardship. We also acknowledge the longer history of these lands and our place in that history. So, who are Drs. Gunter and Dr. Gooding? And why is this lecture series named in their honor? Both. Dr. Lori Martin Gunther and Dr. Marion F. Gooding. Both were directors of the Department of Nursing here at Penn State University. Dr. Gunther was the head of the department way back in 1971 and assumed the interim position in 1984, retired as Professor Emeritus here in 1987, uh, and she passed away in June of 2015. Um, Dr. Marion Gooding was the fifth head of the Department of Nursing here from 1985 to 1987. So under the auspices of my office and working with mm -hmm. our dean, this lecture series was devised to not only highlight the work that we do in diversity, equity, and inclusion in our college, but to also honor the contributions of these two former directors. And a lot of people are not aware that this uh, College of Nursing in its history had not one, but two uh, Black directors. All right, so that is why we're here. So I'm gonna put this at the beginning because if I put it at the end, I'll forget someone. We arrive here with a lot of help. Uh, this is our second annual uh, Gunther Gooding Lecture. And I really want to take just a very quick moment to thank the people here, uh, the office of Dr. Kelly Walgas, um, uh, my colleague uh, and assistant dean, 
uh, for a community in our school who was really helpful with our CE program today. Amy Forsythe, Morgan McPhee, Corey uh, Johannesburg, uh, Shannon Holliday, who is my assistant in my office. Shannon, thank you for all of your tireless work and effort. Tana McGee Wagner, Joni Scott, Evan Williams, the new director of the Paul Robeson Cultural Center, who is a co-sponsor of this event today. Thank you, Evan. The College of Nursing's Diversity and Equity uh, Committee, the Multicultural Student Nursing Association, which you're gonna hear from in a moment, who is also a co-sponsor of this event. So for those of you who have signed up and who are nurses, in order to get your CE, attendance at this activity will earn you one contact hour through the Penn State Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing. To receive that one contact hour, you must attend the full program, complete the evaluation provided at the end of the program. The Penn State Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing is approved with distinction as a provider of nursing continuum professional development by the Pennsylvania State Nurses Association, an accredited approver of the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission and Accreditation. The topic of this education is uh, non-clinical and therefore uh, we did not identify, mitigate, or disclose relevant financial relationships. The evaluation link will be emailed to you at the conclusion of the program. All right, that's the technical aspects of the program. So um, I'm now going to invite my colleague, Dr. Raymond Brown, who is going to bring greetings on behalf of the Office of the Dean. I feel guilty. I'm carrying a piece of paper in. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, good morning. I am, as Sheldon said, uh, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs. Dean Badzik is unable to be here today. Her mother died on Saturday. But on her behalf, I would like to welcome everyone, extend a very warm welcome for today's lecture, the um, Gunter Gooding Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Lecture. The lecture series is fully supported by the Dean's Office. And it is part of the college's diversity, equity, inclusion strategies. And also the topic today conveys the college's dedication to the critical issue of maternal health. Dr. Canty, it is just thrilling to have you with us today um, to share your expertise and your insights on addressing maternal health and uh, the crisis that we have in that and how um, research and education can help us. It is our hope that the insights today shared will be used to inspire meaningful dialogue, collaborative efforts, and most importantly, tangible actions to improve maternal health outcomes and make a real difference in the lives of mothers and their families. I encourage all of you to be actively involved I think I'm touching his screen, so you're seeing a, a snippet of it. I encourage you to be um, involved, um, ask questions, to um, um, make sure that you share your thoughts and your ideas. Together, we can work toward a future where maternal health is a priority for all and where every mother receives the high quality care that she deserves and at a time in her life that is very pivotal. Your engagement is vital as we collectively develop innovative solutions and also strategies to tackle the crisis. I believe that knowledge is a powerful tool. Research-driven education can be a catalyst for transformative change. So once again, I welcome each and every one of you. Thank you very much for joining us. And I truly believe that together we can make a difference. So enjoy the lecture and be sure to share all your comments. She's going to be with us all day. So thank you, Dr. Brown. And we send our condolences to Dean Badzik and her family uh, who are uh, in Florida.
So for those of you who may not be familiar with our College of Nursing, we are one college geographically dispersed. And when we were named, uh, this is a depiction of everywhere in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania where we have a nursing program throughout the Penn State University system. We are currently coming to you, for those of you online, from our main campus at University Park. So this is the part of the presentation that will precede Dr. Canty's comments. And we give an opportunity to our student sponsor group, the uh, Multicultural Student Nursing Association. Last year, again, with the support of the Office of the Dean, uh, we took a group of students uh, to attend the National Black Nurses Association Conference. This is a picture from that conference last year in Chicago, myself and three uh, students. What they're gonna talk about today is their um, going to the conference this past summer, which was the 54th annual uh, MBNA Institute and Conference that was held in Atlanta, Georgia, in August. And to do that, I'm going to bring you Sydney Nash, uh, one of the students in MSNA. Sydney? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, I will be presenting here, but I also have a few of other students from Hershey that will be coming in. Um, so this is our presentation about our summer in Atlanta. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Alex. Perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandra, and I'm going to start by talking a little bit about MSNA. So we are the Multicultural Student Nursing Organization, which is an organization dedicated to providing networking, career development, and fellowship opportunities for underrepresented students at Penn State. And we strive to create a sense of community and safe space for all of our members throughout their college experience. So we're really excited to share with you guys what we've been doing and how we have spent our time this summer. So just to introduce myself again, I'm Alexandra Reeves. I'm a third year student here at Hershey Medical Center and I'm the co-president of MSNA. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor Goodwin. I'm also a third year student at Hershey Medical Center and I'm the secretary for MSNA. I'm Sydney, I'm a third year and I'm the VP of University Park. Hello everyone, I'm Morgan Schweitzer. I'm also a third year and I'm the VP at Hershey. And then Mamadi couldn't join us today because he's in clinical, but he's uh, our only senior and he's on the social chair. What is MBNA? The National Black Nurses Association, or MBNA, was founded in 1971 with the mission to serve as the voice for Black nurses and diverse populations, ensuring equal access to professional development, promoting educational opportunities, and improving health. So here we just have a brief overview of the 2023 conference. It was held in Atlanta, Georgia. It took place from August 1st to the 6th. And the theme this year was 50 years and beyond leading the way in innovation, environments, advocacy, mentorship, and community engagement. So there are a lot of lectures that we had the opportunity of attending. One of the lectures actually Dr. Canty presented at, I reckon it with racism and nursing. Um, there's also one about post-COVID implications for Black nurses, um, hearing about the built environment, which I had never heard of, um, and then the real talk, Mastering the Art of Conversation with Patients on Sexual Health and HIV, which we also got to do a little bit of workshopping with the people around us in our tables, which I thought was really nice to talk with other people. So this is the third event that MSNA has had the opportunity to attend that was put on by MBNA. So through past MBNA events that we attended, we had the opportunity to get a general understanding of what health equity is. 
which we concluded is the assurance of the conditions of optimal health for all people. But this year, entering with a greater level of understanding has allowed us to experience new perspective on health, new perspectives on health equity and the factors that contribute to the problem. So we reshaped our thinking from a standpoint of health inequity being a problem that needs to be fixed to it being an urgent public health crisis. So that I think that this equation that we learned about in the conference perfectly described what contributes to health inequity, which is access challenges and unmet social needs, which equals inequitable outcomes. And these inequitable outcomes are shown in these in the slide, um, in these statistics to the right, showing that three times as many Black Americans die from childbirth. Black Americans live four years less on average. Black Americans are 77% more likely to develop diabetes and other chronic conditions, and 2% more likely to die from heart disease. So I think all of these things just show like the importance of putting a stop to health inequity. And that's something that we took away from the conference. Here are some more slides from presentations at the conference. We went to multiple sessions featuring multiple educational sessions covering crucial topics, including sexual health, health disparities, and the role of communities in healthcare. These sessions were valuable because it provided us insight into Black nurses, shedding light on the factors influencing their communities and informing nurses with the knowledge on what they can do to improve the healthcare system as a whole. So a major uh, theme of the conference was the built environment. And the built environment includes all the physical parts where we live and work, um, including streets, open spaces, infrastructure, homes, building. And the built environment basically is what influences a person's level of physical activity and their social determinants of health and just basically how it impacts them based on their availability to get appointments and just how they're able to get in and get health care. So at the event, we also got to visit the exhibit hall, um, which on the left, there were pop-up shops where you could buy jewelry, there were dresses, there were books from different authors. Um, on the right here, um, one of the big sponsors is CeraVe. So that was us at the CeraVe table learning about their different formulas for their cleansers. Um, and then there was many different organizations that came, as you see in the middle. Um, those were nurse anesthetists and Mamadi. He was learning how to intubate someone. So there were many different colleges and organizations that came to talk, and we got to talk to a lot of different ones. So these are some pictures from the Under 40 Forum by Vitas Healthcare, which we always really enjoy every year. Um, the picture at the top shows us um, with students from the University of Pittsburgh Black Student Nurses Association, which we have been attending MBNA events with them for a while. Um, and we especially enjoy the Under 40 Forum because it allows us to see individuals who look like us in positions of leadership and excellence, which not only fosters a sense of belonging, but also inspires us as students to persevere um, through the challenges of academics and higher education as a whole. And it also allowed us the opportunity to, you know, find mentors and receive advice from, from other individuals at the conference who were under 40. Here are some pictures for the annual men's bow tie breakfast, which Mamadi and Dr. Fields attended. This is an annual gathering that takes place every Thursday during the MBNA conference. It's known as the men's bow tie event, exclusively for men, providing a platform for in depth discussions on pertinent topics concerning men's health, including mental well being. This year, MBNA introduced a groundbreaking addition to the event named the Barbershop. It serves as a secure and open space particularly catering to the needs of Black men, allowing them to engage in meaningful conversations about the challenges and issues that directly affect their lives. So this year, um, Penn State have had two of its own um, chosen to serve on the NBNA National Board. Um, student Mamadi Kroma uh, was selected as the student representative, 
And our very own Dr. Sheldon Fields was sworn in as the 13th president of the National Black Nurses Association. Yes. <laughs> So there was a lot of support from Penn State. So I just want to give a special thank you to Dr. Sheldon Fields, um, Dr. Sierra Funk, who is our secondary advisor for MSNA, um, Dr. Monique Balthazar, who's the newest addition to our faculty, and Cody Hoffman. And then a special thank you to Dean Lori Badsack, who's always shown us support, whether it's being at our meetings or coming all the way to Atlanta. We really appreciate her support being there for us. So this is just some pictures from our time in Atlanta. Um, we always have such a great time at MBNA. We had the opportunity to speak with old friends that we've met at old MBNA conferences and also make some new connections, which is also always so important to us and part of you know what we are doing at MSNA. We want to provide people with opportunities for networking, and this is exactly that. Um, again, thank you all for supporting us and to the whole College of Nursing for allowing us these opportunities. And yes, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Okay, so questions for the students. We'll start with the audience. That means they, they were, it was like either really great or what? No questions? No current student wants to know how they can go next year? Nothing? So how about we assume that question? So how do you get to go to the National Black Nursing Association Conference next year? One, join MSNA. Two, as the current president of the National Black Nurses Association, I invite you all to join. So I get the question a lot. Dr. Fields, I'm not Black. Can I join a National Black Nurses Association? Yes, you can. The requirement to join NBNA is very simple. If you support our mission and our vision, you are most welcome to join. And that is for faculty. That is for students at all levels. Uh, we have 112 chapters in 34 states, including the District of Columbia. So it is about networking. It is about connecting people. It is about uplifting communities in which nurses, Black nurses and nurses of color live, work, die, and play. And again, you are absolutely welcome to join us. Um, the location for our next conference, we have not yet announced, but uh, we usually meet sometime in July or August, and we will do that again. So for current Penn State students, um, and again, I really want to reiterate what Sydney and other students said. Uh, with the generous support of funds from the the uh, the dean, the uh, office of Al Dean Lori Badzik, your trip to this conference is free. In addition to uh, registration that we make sure you have uh, that covers from the National Black Nurses Association, so. Any uh, questions online for the students? Let me see, I think I need to go back and see if I can see the questions. All right, there's 149 of you online. If anyone has a question, you can put it into the q and I have a question. Go ahead, Dr. Canty. So if a student is like a little nervous about joining, mm -hmm. what would you tell them? So, you know, <laughs> There's a thousand organizations and student activities here at Penn State. You all know that. Um, if you are interested at all, simply talk to one of the current members, talk to any student that's a part of MSNA, um, talk to me. Um, you have the benefit of having the national president as part of your faculty. My office is open. You can make an appointment. Come talk to me. Happy to talk with any student at any time. I actually talked to quite a few students who contacted me on LinkedIn or, or other forms of social media. Um, I talk to students all the time. It is part of my job. It's part of what we do in our office. And is in a, in NBN, NBNA is simply an extension of what I do as the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion in our college. So ask. 
All right. Yeah, I was a little nervous at first to join a new organization, especially like my freshman year, because it was still kind of COVID, you know, we we're wearing masks and everything. So I wasn't sure about like going out and putting myself into these spaces. But I've had a really great time, especially going to the NBNA con conference. I've got to know um, my board members really well. So I would really recommend putting yourself out there and joining these kinds of organizations. All right. Well, I um, really want to thank uh, Sydney and the students for a great presentation. And if there are no others, we're going to move on in our... Oh, I do. Thank you, Dr. Wolgas. Just wanted to say what a great job the students did. That's great. I want to say the students have a wonderful presentation, and I commend the university for providing this important opportunity for them. Uh, do you have to be a nurse? Do you have to be a nurse to join NBNA? No, we have affiliate memberships. Uh, you can become a supporter um, and you can find all that information out on our website at nbna.org, but you absolutely do not have to be a nurse. We'll, we'll let you join, but don't be surprised if we try to make you into a nurse. <laughs> That's part of what we did. And don't be surprised if you, if you find yourself wanting to go to nursing school. So, but we support that as well. Um, one of the things that we do in, uh, there are several other ethnic minority nursing associations that we work with. We all work together in a coalition called the National Coalition of Ethnic Minority Nursing Associations. That includes NON, the National Association of Hispanic Nurses, APINA, the Asian Pacific Islander Nursing Association, PNAA, the Filipino Nursing Association of America, and Ana Nina, the Native American, Native Alaskan uh, Nursing Association. So, you know, one of the things that, that, that um, I would encourage students to do, we are here to support you, you are our future. And with these associations, we help you. And what do I mean by help? At our conference in August, uh, MBNA facilitated giving away over $300,000 in scholarships. Anybody want help paying their tuition? They're really expensive Penn State tuition? Just saying. Mamadi walked away with a $10,000 scholarship. So there are benefits to membership. I will just tell you that. All right. So we are now going to move forward. And I'm going to bring up, give me a moment to bring up Dr. Canty's uh, presentation. And our... Um, guest scholar is Dr. Lucinda Canty. Her topic today is going to be addressing the maternal health crisis through nursing research and education. Uh, Dr. Canty is a self-identified Black woman moved by an intimate understanding of how a community suffers when someone loses a wife, mother, sister, or daughter during pregnancy, childbirth, or the postpartum period. The ultimate goal of her research is to design interventions that reduce maternal mortality among Black women. Her scholarly trajectory emerged from 29 years of providing healthcare to women as a certified nurse midwife. She became passionate about developing knowledge that could be used by healthcare providers to prevent maternal death among Black women. She advocates for improving maternal health outcomes and eliminating racial disparities. She has done this through her scholarship, and more importantly, by establishing Lucinda's House, a community service and website providing resources, support, and connecting healthcare professionals to communities most impacted by poor maternal health outcomes. She has also created and is the host of Overdue Reckoning on Addressing Racism in Nursing, which led to a leadership role and developing a documentary about nurses of color's experiences with racism. Dr. Candy is an academic nurse scholar, nurse midwife, recognized as a national leader in scholarship and advocacy to improve Black maternal mortality and anti-racism work. Her research fills a critical knowledge gap by focusing on actional interventions to improve maternal health outcomes. She served as a consultant for the Government Accountability Office on two major reports, COVID-19 and the impact on maternal health 
and increasing diversity in the midwifery workforce. She was one of seven nurses invited to the White House for a nursing round table for the Gender Policy Committee. Dr. Canty is currently an associate professor of nursing at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and director of the SeedWorks Health Equity in Nursing Program. She earned her BS in nursing from Columbia University, her MS in nursing midwifery from Yale University School of Nursing, and her PhD in nursing science from the University of Connecticut. This coming October, 2023, just next, right, coming up in about a week, she will be inducted as a fellow in what is the most prestigious nursing academy, the American Academy of Nursing. So, as she comes, I also want you to know that Dr. Canty went through great deeds to make sure she was here today. Why? Her flight got canceled from Philadelphia to State College, which is if you ever tried to fly from Philadelphia to State College, you understand what that is. Dr. Canty drove three hours to be here. I cannot thank her enough. I am excited that she is here. She is a phenomenal nurse researcher, a colleague. Dr. Canty, the stage is yours. I am honored, honored to be here. Just even what this presentation, what this diversity event represents, two African-American nurses who were chair of this nursing apartment, that's amazing history, amazing history. So I was, if I had to walk, I don't know if I would be, I probably would have just showed up here at this moment, but I was gonna walk to get here. So I wanna thank Dr. Sheldon Fields for inviting me and the Dean also, I, I'm so grateful. I'm sorry I couldn't see her, but I understand. And I'm looking forward to meeting her actually next week. Mm -hmm. And I have to talk to, I have to definitely thank Shannon Holiday. Thank you so much. She really took care of me and just made, and I, and I thought of her too, when they were like, your flight is canceled. I was like, I gotta get there for Shannon, <laughs> if anyone else. So I wanna thank you as well. So today I'm going to share just a little bit about myself, my work, but how as in nursing, what we can do to address the maternal health crisis. And I'm gonna even talk a little bit about that and how that looks. So, and there's different parts of who I am. I'm a mom, my son, Ryan, every time I present somewhere, he's like, please tell them you have a son named Ryan. <laughs> so my son is now 14. So he's kind of been on this journey with me through going from my, for, for my PhD into this moment now. So I stand here for also for him because I think things in our healthcare system have to change. So I'm a qualitative researcher. I, quantitative, I believe, does have a very important place, but there's nothing like qualitative research. I love hearing the stories behind the numbers. Um, I have a Black feminist perspective approach, and I feel like we have to be in the community. As nurses, we have to be in the communities that we serve, not just in the hospital. We have to get out to where people live. We talked about, we saw the slide about social determinants of health and built environments. We need to be in those environments so that we can tell and talk to people first who are from those communities. And I'm gonna talk about that. But I also love history, especially nursing history. And my love for history came wanting to know more about where do I sit as a black student in nursing? So it started, my journey started as a student and continued as I went through my education. And I love art storytelling, and you'll see my artwork throughout the presentation. And my art, I just feel like there's a place for that in nursing and not just textbooks, not just papers, there's ways that we can express ourselves. And I wanna share a poem, just to give you a little touch of what I also do. And this poem is entitled, Still the Dream. I wanted to care for those who couldn't care for themselves, to provide comfort when one is in pain, to provide hope, when one is uncertain, to provide a listening ear when one is afraid to speak. It started with a dream. In this dream, my imagination runs wild. In my existence, I could only see possibilities. I could see myself dancing in the sea, 
although I don't know how to swim. I can see myself standing on the mountaintop, although I'm afraid of heights. At where I could talk about my accomplishments and not be afraid to shine, stopping those from dimming my light. I could tell stories of my ancestors and see my future in their light. I could speak the truth and everyone understands, even those who don't speak my language. I see freedom and hope our joy and our beauty is not just our dream, this can be our reality. So I am still gonna to continue to dream this dream. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share that. So my research does center on the voices of black women. And I do want to state that I do know that not everyone who gives birth identifies as being female or woman. This is my area of expertise, and I don't want to say that we all have the same experiences, because I think that we get into trouble when we do that. So I also know that the maternal health crisis really impacts all of us. It's just that Black women are at the core. They're the most vulnerable. Even as we have all this technology, we're still dying, and I'm going to talk about that. But when you look at racial disparities in maternal health, Black women are always have the worst out health outcomes. We know maternal mortality, three to four times more likely to die. You can go to some areas of this country and it's as high as 12 times more likely to die compared to white women. We're twice as likely to experience life-threatening conditions. So we're going in to give birth and we may not, we may become ill and we're not sure if we're even gonna survive. Twice as likely to have issues with infertility, perinatal loss, even infant mortality that our babies are not even making it past one year. And I recently learned how even someone who is receiving infertility treatment, black babies are more likely to die. So this is what really thrives my work, but not only to look at what the issues are, but also to understand the beauty and importance of what we have to contribute to nursing, to research, to education. So any opportunity I have, I'm gonna uplift the voices and experiences of black women. And I always feel that if you improve the health of black women, everybody benefits from that. So what I talk about today can benefit really any community. And as you are working as nurses, as you're learning and you're doing clinical, I want you to think about where do you sit in that? And I just wanna just show some statistics, but I think we all pretty much know that the United States has a lot of issues when it comes to caring for women who are pregnant, postpartum and during childbirth. So look at the statistics. And we, do, we did know that there would be an increase due to COVID, but this, these issues started before COVID happened and they're still continuing to get worse. And look at how we compare to other countries. When, when I had my son, who's gonna be 14 next month, when I gave birth to him, I didn't even realize that it was safer for me to be in a small African country where their midwife would not come out at night so I might have to have someone close to me deliver my baby who had no medical experience at all. Can you imagine it would be safer for me to have my baby in those conditions than the United States? So I had to work. That's what my research is really trying to understand why that happens. And when we look at race, and this is from 2018 to 2021, with black women in the middle, the green. So look at the racial disparities that exist. I'll also like to point out even though we're looking at, and this is from the CDC, Hispanic women, even though they've always had the lowest, they were even lower um, mortality rates than white women, but for the first time in 20 years, they're surpassing that. So even though they're still, even though nobody should be dying from childbirth, but even though they have very low rates compared to black women, we have to understand and try to think about why that's happening. We need to start looking at prevention. Uh, also what's missing, are statistics for those who are indigenous. We don't see those statistics yet. And I'm really worried, I'm wondering if they're gonna surpass black women, especially over the last two years. They've always been pretty close, but I'm wondering if that delay in having those numbers released is because they're extremely high. So we'll see if they're released within the next, hopefully within the next few months before this year is out. But these are the things that, that really kind of want me to look more 
Because with racial disparities, it's telling me that we know how to treat conditions. And I forgot to mention that 80% of maternal deaths are preventable. Meaning if one action was done, whether it was the nurse at the bedside, the clinician, from the patient, from someone in the community, if one person did something, that, that death could have been prevented. And that's my area that I, I focus on. And it's just important to understand that no one should be dying from childbirth. But with all the technology we have, we have the top medical institutions in the world. So why is it that I'm still hearing Black women say, I don't know if I want to get pregnant. I'm not sure if I'm going to survive. That's really heartbreaking to me. And my research is to help with that uncertainty, with that fear. And these are just some of the factors that we believe, or that I should say we know, but we're still having some challenges with understanding that impact our health and well-being. One, we know that racism is a factor. Our nursing textbooks still say race is a factor. Being Black does not mean you're going to die during childbirth. It's the lived experience that places you at risk. Because what I found, when I started my research, women were being blamed for their health outcomes. And through my research, and I have to even tell you that I start to believe that. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go with my research. I'm going to do an intervention. I'm going to educate them. So they start prenatal care early. And they're going to have, they're, everything, everything's going to be good. Maternal mortality is going to be cured. But what I found is that you could go to every single appointment. You could eat right. You could exercise. You could be Serena Williams. You could be Tori Bowie. And you could still die or come close to dying during childbirth if you're Black in this country. So that's something that I will never sit with, well with, until I know that it's being addressed. So racism is real. Weathering is a reaction of our bodies to that, to have that constant stress. And what I mean by constant stress is I don't have the luxury of saying, waking up and saying, oh, I'm not going to put on my Black skin today. I'm going to be white so I can have privilege. It's not that easy. So as a Black woman, every day I have to experience something related to race. It could be as simple as going to CVS and someone following me around to see if I'm going to steal. Or I tell someone this is what I'm experiencing, and they devalue that. So if you experience that on a daily basis, what does that do to the body? What does that do to one mentally and physically? And again, I don't want to. I want to make sure that we're not saying that the woman is not taking care of herself. Is really about how society is making us feel and what that's doing to our bodies. And one of the most things, like with the quote that you said about the most shocking thing, is the mistreatment during childbirth or really anything with healthcare. Is when we go into the healthcare system, we want to trust that that person in front of us, regardless of where they're from, that they're going to take the best care of us. And some of us don't sit easy with that yet because we don't feel that comfort. But that's what I'm hoping that we get one day. And of just other factors I'll go through very quickly, social determinants of health, where we live, where we play, where we work, um, access to quality health care. Like I said, somebody could start prenatal care at six weeks and they could still have poor maternal health outcomes. So why is that if they're in the system? And we're also looking at diversity in health care providers. And we know for some of us, we're in communities where no one looks like us. So how do we make sure that when we're seeing someone who doesn't look like us, that we still get the quality of care that we, we deserve? So there's still really no clear way to understand how these factors impact the lives of Black women. And I think that's an area for research and for education. But understanding these factors will help us know what it's like when we enter the healthcare system, how people are being treated. And so just really, what can we do? What can nurse researchers do and educators do? What can you do as students, as faculty, again, as researchers, what can you do? And it starts with really understanding. There are some states where they're trying to get away with teaching black history. For me, history was empowering to learn, even though it's painful, I'm not saying it wasn't painful, but it empowered me. A couple of things that stood out with my history is one, is that the moment that Black women's feet touched this earth in the United States, we didn't have control over our bodies, but we still survived and we made it through. And then hearing those stories of survival have been uplifting and empowering for me. And the other is with nursing. We were providing nursing care and midwifery care 
before programs were institutionalized, before nursing education was institutionalized. But then we were told we weren't smart enough. But several of us still became nurses anyways. So those are things when I look at my history that gives us strength. But this is a history that we all should know. So that when you see someone from a certain community, you know that they're, they're valued and they have a right to be here. So that's why all of us should learn this history. So I think learning that, knowing that racism is real, we're all on different journeys when it comes to understanding racism, when it comes to being anti-racist. There are some people who never talk about race at all in their life. They never said they experienced racism. And that's a beautiful thing, but that's not everyone's story. But just acknowledging that it's real, especially if someone has the courage to share with you their experience. And then you're like, are you sure? Just listen and let them talk and learn from what they're experiencing. So I just think those things are important, but also looking at the structures that are in place. Our healthcare system is very complex. I'm telling you as a midwife, I still have to navigate my way through. It's very challenging. So think about those that don't have that healthcare background, how they're just sometimes trying to survive and get through. And just think of the stress and the fear and anxiety that comes with that. But we have to be more intentional. And there's something that all of us can do where we're at, even if it's just acknowledging that things are not right. And we know that it's no longer race. Again, you could go to your textbooks right now, any course, it'll say that race is a risk factor, when again, it's really racism. And I just wanna just quickly just show that there's different levels. When I graduated from nursing school, I thought I knew everything about racism. And I thought it was just someone calling you a name or treating you poorly. But what I learned is that there's different levels to it. There is the personally mediated, how you treat someone on that individual level. And then there's internalized for someone that's constantly experiencing that, that their history is not important, that they're not important, that when they go in for healthcare and they're treated away a certain way, well, maybe I was meant to be treated that way. So we internalize that. And that's an area that's understudied when it comes to research. What does internalized racism do to our healthcare behaviors or how we navigate the healthcare system? One of the most challenging is institutionalized or structural racism. Some people say systemic racism. They're all different levels at looking at the systems in place. And those are the most challenging because they're embedded so deep that any one of us could become part of that system. And for myself as an educator, I had to look at it and say, you know what, this is not right. This policy is eliminating people from this program who look like me. So I had to decide, are you gonna to continue to follow that or are you gonna challenge the systems? And you know, I had to start a little trouble and I challenged the system. So, and don't be afraid to challenge because sometimes it's really scary to wanna to speak up. But I learned that if I didn't, I was carrying a burden that I didn't want to carry alone. So any, again, any one of us could become part of that system. So in nursing research, what can we do? And we have to not focus on race. If you're designing a research project, you wanna look at a population. If you focus just on race, you could miss the other parts of that person's lived experience. And understanding again, how racism, racism shows up in people's lives, that's where we really should look and really go deep. And those are the, that's where we're gonna get that information that we need to dismantle it. Because the power of racism is that we don't talk about it, that we're afraid but we have to start having conversations and talk about it and talk to people who are most impacted. And just keep in mind that racialized people are valuable sources of knowledge. So if you wanna do a research study and understand, go to the people most impacted. You could go to your textbooks and learn from your textbooks, but that still doesn't give you a realistic picture of what it's like to be racialized in this country. And they, a lot of times they know the issues. They will tell you, I could go to any woman right now and say, what are your issues when you went to get prenatal care? And they'll tell me right away. They'll talk about their relationship with their provider, you know, their insurance. They'll talk about all the things and what they want and what should have been there when they got their care. So it's very important to realize that they understand the structures and they know the solutions. And nursing scholars of color, if you're doing a paper or you're just looking up a topic or you want to learn more, go to scholars of color and read their work. There's a lot of scholars of color who are already doing the work from every single community that you can think of. So don't be able to do those research um, searches so that you can find their information as well and incorporate their work into your presentations, into your research. But you have to have members on the team that are from the communities as well. 
that's really so important. So and also with data collection, but also with looking at the data. Because if you don't know about a community or a culture, how you interpret that, how you interpret those results could not be representative of the community. So have researchers there who are from these communities that can help with that. And you have to establish relationships with the community. If you wanna say you wanna improve black maternal health, then talk to a black woman. Talk, go in the community where there are a lot of black people and, and just learn. You don't wanna go in saying that you know all the answers and you start telling them how to take care of themselves. You're gonna get kicked out really quick. Even for myself, as a black woman, as a nurse midwife, when I do my research, I can't go in the research like I'm a participant and I know their experience. And I have to tell you that I learned so much from those that I talked to and I'm gonna share my research with you. But it's so important to establish those relationships. And I just wanna finish with allow students of color to dream. When I was an undergraduate student, no one talked to me about doing research. No one talked to me about learning about my culture, learning about nurses of color. So we have to make sure that we provide spaces where people can dream, dream about what they wanna do in their community, even dream to be a nurse. There are some of us who want to become a nurse and people said, oh, are you sure that's a hard, that's hard work. You know, maybe you might get in that college, maybe. Or when I want to become a nurse midwife, Oh, are you sure? And Yale was the only program in my community. You know, I would have to travel. I don't want to travel out of state. I want to stay in state. Oh, Yale is so hard. Are you sure you're going to get into there? You got to have a backup plan. I apply anyways, and I didn't have a backup plan. I just prayed really hard. And, and I'm glad that they gave me an opportunity, but still allow us to dream. And when it comes to research, because I hear of undergraduate students, PhD students, wanting to look at how racism has influenced their lives or the, their communities. And they're being told, oh no, don't study that. You know, that's not important. You look at this, this is more important. Or when you're a doctoral level student, oh no, look, don't do that. Look at my research. Why don't you help me with my research? So allow us to dream and think about what we can do in our communities and provide us resources. I know it could be very scary when someone talks about, oh, I wanna look at racism. A lot of times we don't wanna look at racism because we're afraid that there were things that maybe we saw or that we participated in. And maybe we knew that it could cause harm to um, people of color, maybe we did it. But I think there's a lot of fear that we have to let down that fear. And there's so many resources now that you can educate yourself. For nursing education, if you're gonna talk about Florence Nightingale, talk about Mary Sicoli, talk about other nurses of color. When I was a nursing student, I didn't hear of any nurses of color. It wasn't until I was in my, my master's program that I started to learn. So we just have to talk about this so that people know um, Florence Nightingale contributed a lot to nursing. We know that. But so did Mary Sicoli. So that's Su Susie King Taylor. So just bring up, even I have a friend that even went and, and looked up Hispanic nurses. And she was like, I didn't know this history. And she's, in, she's um, 20 years in nursing. She's like, no one ever told me. So we should at least introduce that to students but we have to educate ourselves so that we can do that. And we have to realize that race is a social construct, but it has very real implications in our healthcare system. So we're educating our students. And for those of you as students, educate yourself to realize that this is real. And what can I do from where I'm at to make sure that my patient is safe? For nurses educators, we have to position ourselves so that we can talk about the levels of racism and how they show up. But another important part is our textbooks, our curriculum is based in whiteness where there's no room for anyone else. When there's harmful content, we can remove that. I use that as teachable moments. So like our nursing textbook, our maternity textbook talked about black and Hispanic women exag basically exaggerating their pain. It was in the textbooks. But if I, I teach, if I taught that and I allowed that to be, students were gonna believe that. So I said, you know, you see this little box about culture? Rip that page out and rip it into tiny pieces. No, I didn't tell students that. <laughs> what, I what I did tell students was that these are based on stereotypes. If you're gonna assess pain, assess pain on an individual level, not by their racial group. So, it, so anyways, we're, we have a responsibility to our students to make sure that when we see things in our textbooks, that we bring it up. If we don't, we're failing our students. So we have to give them that opportunity. And if a student is in class and there are some brave students that will say, um, 
I'm black and this is not right. Don't shut them down. Say, why are you saying that? Well, we don't eat like this or we do this in our culture. So this, and this book is stereotypical. And I've seen that along a lot of different cultures. So if there's misinformation, harmful information, and a student brings it up, allow them the space to talk about it. Because when we shut them down, we're saying that they're not important and their experiences are not important. And we have to connect with the communities. And I'm gonna just show you just a couple of things. And these are just some questions. Um, and it's just asking you to just look at your materials. Look at if you're on a research team, who is on your team if you're studying racial disparities? Who, how are you being held accountable? So when you're doing your research, how is this gonna influence communities of color? Just some things to think about. And what are you doing to be anti-oppressive, anti-racist in your classroom? What steps are you taking? That's one area of our of faculty evaluation we're not evaluated on. So maybe we shouldn't consider that. So I wanna just kind of switch a little bit and just talk about my research. And I am gonna open it up for questions. Because I know I'm giving a lot of information. I want to be able to talk with everyone about this. But um, for my, um, my dissertation, the doctoral dissertation, my um, research focused on interviewing women who had, Black women who had severe life-threatening complications. Because I wanted to know, to develop interventions, to, to look at solutions, I just want to know what that experience was like so that I could see what it was for them, but also what, what is it that they need and want from the healthcare system. And these are just a very quick overview of the, my findings. And one is that knowledge. They wanted information. So many of them didn't understand their, their um, complication until they were diagnosed. They didn't know anything about it. And some, there was one woman who had, um, she delivered her baby 10 minutes, 10 months out. She had started to have chest, she always felt tired since she delivered, but she started having chest pain and difficulty breathing and went into the emergency room to be evaluated. She was evaluated and told that she just had a little angina to go home and rest. But as she started to leave, another provider, cardiologist came in and stopped her and said, you can't go home yet. I need you to, we need to do more tests. She doesn't know where he came from, but she believes that her nurse went to get help. So it turned out that she was in heart failure, that if her heart didn't improve in three months, she was gonna need a heart transplant. And she was completely blindsided by this diagnosis and she also was saying that if I left and just went home to rest, I may not have waken up. So, and she said, you know, if I, and then she ended up doing her own research. And she's like, you know, cardiovascular disease is a leading killer of women. And how come I didn't know this when I was having all the symptoms? So it was just so important to educate our communities, not only to educate in the way they care for themselves, but unfortunately we have to educate so they can advocate for themselves when they come in for care. So anyways, education was important. The relationship with the healthcare provider, extremely important. Either their providers made them feel like they were safe and well cared for, or their provider made them feel like they were just part of the routine. You go in the room, you do your blood pressure, you do a pain scale, no compassion in the care whatsoever. Women who felt safe in their care said the nurses, they talked to me. They told me, listen, I know that you wanna get out of bed on your own, but I want you to call me for help. I'll let you do it independently, but I wanna be here. One of the women in my study said that if the nurses weren't on top of her care, that she could have died. She ended up, she was just in the room by herself and she said they came in frequently and checked on her, that she passed out, she didn't even know what happened. And apparently she had a hemorrhage, but because the nurses were there, they were on top of it. And she said, they took excellent care of me. But she said they were watching me and they were saying, you know, they were just very, very um, involved in my care. And even one was told that any problem is a big problem. If you're not sure, just call us and we'll tell you. And just to have someone say that to her made her feel empowered, but also made her feel like somebody cared about her. And we know that race matters. That came out that we know when someone who's Black enters the healthcare system, that there's ways that their care, they're not getting the care that they receive. Not everyone, but people can tell you that tests are not offered to them. Follow-up is not offered to them. Even informed consent is not properly taken. So there are so many things that just being a person of color in this country, you can, it can dictate your care and it could prevent you from just getting the basic standard of care. The last two just have to do with the mental health and well being. And one was just being, you know, you're going to have your baby, no one tells you you're gonna die, right? We, everyone worries about pain. 
even when I'm doing childbirth classes, I'll have men that's when I'm like, what are you concerned about? Even the men will be like the pain. They'll even say that. But nobody thinks about death. And for these women, it wasn't a reality until they were in their situation. And it had a profound impact on their mental health and well-being. And unfortunately, the women in my study didn't have that even assessed. No one checked in and said, how are you doing? What's going on? And so it just shows the importance of taking care of them physically and mentally. And so I took that my research and developed Lucinda's House, which is a community initiative. I wanted a space where Black women, all women of color felt safe. We focused on prevention. We looked at physical and mental aspects and unconditional non-judgmental support. So however you show up, you're gonna be well cared for. Wherever you come from, you're gonna be well cared for. And I had to recognize and allow space for black women to say what their concerns and their issues are. And this is a community effort. So my programs that I develop focus on what their needs are. Not what I go in and say, this is what you need. They tell me what they need and I find the resources. And really what I feel is important is to protect the health and well-being of pregnant black women. And again, finding out what it is that they need. And I just wanna share just a couple other research studies. So this is something I'm doing at UMass Amherst with uh, my colleagues. And this is an interdisciplinary um, grant that we received to do this study. We're looking at transportation and how that um, influences the experience of um, prenatal care. And it's not about, again, when you're doing research, I'm not giving them a pamphlet. I'm not just giving them a survey to fill out. We're in the community. So they're gonna be interviewed and then we're gonna go on a ride along with them. So if they're on the bus, we're gonna be on the bus with them and we have cameras to follow. We're gonna make sure everybody else is, you know, we're gonna be confidential, but we're still gonna follow them to see what that experience is like. So if they're riding in their car, we're gonna follow behind them in their car. But we're looking at different ways to understand what's happening in the community. I don't know the last time when I was a nursing student, I had to take a bus, I didn't have a car. I couldn't afford a car till I was a nurse. And even then when I got my first paycheck, I drove and I worked the night shift, I drove straight to the bank. That's how much money I needed. <laughs> and that, then I was later able to get a car, but it's been several years since I've been on the bus and I can't tell someone what their experience is like to be pregnant on the bus. So for me to understand that, I have to be a part of that. So that's what our research, we call it a ride along. And then we interview them after to see if there's anything that comes up after. And we also want to know what is it that will help you. But another piece of this too is that I'm not just going in the community to do research. There is a the doula organization, um, Springfield um, doulas. They're, um, they're, they're two doulas, Black women from the community, and they come in contact with women to help recruit for our study. And so we were like, you know, is there anything that we could offer to you? And our research assistant, she bartered me. She was like, is there anyone there? It's like, we want Lucinda. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go in the community and do pregnancy classes and do different things to work with them. Because my thing is like, I don't wanna just do a research study and I'm gone. I wanna to continue to work in the community because I know to address maternal health is not gonna be one study and we're done. So anyway, just one way again to show you how to be involved in the community. So when I do talks, I'm often asked about doing something around pregnancy loss. So during the summer, I did data collection. I'm in the process of doing data analysis, but I interview 16 women who experienced pregnancy loss. And that includes miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, stillbirth, like different women share their story with me. And I do wanna say that black women want to do research, but they wanna feel safe in that process. And they wanna know, what are you gonna do with my results? Are you gonna just present at a conference and then you're done? But they, I, I was very upfront with them. I said, people want me to do some kind of support for women who experience loss, but I can't do that without talking to people that is their lived experience. So already from the interviews, and again, I'm doing, I have very preliminary data that, I, um, that I'm, I'm in that stage, but I'm already seeing things that I can do in the community. And one is just, again, that safe space to be able to share their experience. So that's where Lucinda's house comes from. And I don't do it alone. I have a lot of support from their social workers, public health, um, nursing, different people who aren't even in maternal health. And just even on that, I do want to say that when we're looking at maternal health, maternal health cannot fall within a, just a six-week course. Maternal health should be sprinkled throughout the curriculum. 
whether even in pediatrics, there's chronic conditions that impact pregnancy later. So we need to acknowledge that. There, when we're looking at a medicine, I always say that pregnancy could pop up anywhere, anywhere. And I've had several colleagues tell me that pregnancy has popped up in, in places unimaginable. From the ICU, the emergency room we know. My a friend that works in the emergency room says women come in and just have their babies. She said one woman came in saying that um, there's something in my pants. And when they cut her pants off, it was a baby. So pregnancy is everywhere. High school, if you're a school nurse. So anyways, it's just everywhere. So we all have to be prepared that wherever we're working, we have to make sure that we're looking out and trying to keep anyone who's pregnant safe and making sure that they get the care that they need. But it's a team approach. It is a team approach. And this is just some community baby showers that I've done. This one was in Hartford. We had 101 families come through. Our largest one was in New Haven, Connecticut. And we had 170 families come through. So that's the mother and she had um, her partner and even had children with them. So, and we just bring resources from the community, connecting them with things that they didn't realize they have. And we always have food. And there's nothing like some good collard greens and mac and cheese. But we always have food that we bring, whatever's in the community. And, and most people that come our, our, to our um, community baby showers are Black and Hispanic women. So we want to make sure that we have culturally appropriate food. And it's all about celebration. So I'm going to end here for questions. But just want to say that this is really my research is really to fight for maternal health equity for everyone. Because whoever you are, you should be able to come in and receive safe care and know that that person who's caring for you has your best interest in place. So I'm gonna stop there. And this is just some references if you would like to see the articles that I use. And um, these are from scholars, not, not all from scholars of color, but there are research teams that are even um, mixed. So anyways, I just wanted to also have some references for you as well. But I would like to know if there are any questions. Oh, Shannon? Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. First of all, thank you all for coming and supporting this program. And also, I wanted to announce I've received uh, a few um, emails or messages indicating that people were unable to see the slides. So I told them that I'll see if we can make them available after the program to everyone who's attended, uh, whether in person or via Zoom. So um, we'll probably send around a you know, some sort of notification to indicate that we'll be sending them out to you guys. Okay. If you have a question in the audience, raise your hand. But Laura's going to bring the mic to you. Yeah, stop the share. They just looked at me the whole time. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. So I just want to let you know that. Um, has a physician in the group, and this is something that I really care about also. I'm in OBGYN. And so I do a lot of that. I know your presentation was geared mostly for the nurses, but is there any collaboration that you do with the doctors, with the physician that really cares about this issue also? Yes. And I have to also just let you know that I do presentations, so I share my research with, um, I share my research with really all healthcare providers. Even recently, oh, thank you. Even recently, I went to Yale New Haven. I have their picture in there, but I took it out because I was like, I didn't ask them for permission. <laughs> but I went to OBGYN residence and I presented really, how do you protect black women when they come in? And the thing is like with, um, the, when these are um, OBs and one of them was even waiting for me after and said, you know, we never talk about this. So they were very grateful. And this this, this um, OB even said, I didn't even, these are residents. I should even sit back up and say they were residents. I'm going to be talking to the attendings in December. I'm going to their grand rounds. But this resident said, you know, I never thought about race until you presented. And I'm gonna make sure, because I talked to them about when you go in that room, how do you acknowledge that they're there? When you go in, are they that 39 weaker? Are they that um, that pit, that person on pit? Like, are you going in saying that this is Mrs. Smith? Are you acknowledging her? Because one thing that did come out of really both of my research studies and this current one with perinatal loss is that patients just want to be seen. 
They want you to take a minute and look at them and talk to them. And the residents were saying that they don't always get that. And one even said, you know, um, we don't have time. What, what can we do? And I said, you make the time, but you have to remember that whoever's dictating how your work schedule is, they probably they don't know what your experience is. You have to also let them know too, because it's important to connect. Again, you don't have to spend an hour, but just how are you? You know, something happens and what's going on. Um, one of the women in my um, perinatal study said that there was an old, um, and this is her description, it was an old white OB doctor. She recently had a loss. And she said, he said, do you have any questions? And she was so overwhelmed. He was like, you know, I'm going to wait with you because I know you have questions. So for him to take the moment and say, you know, what's going on? And she said, because he waited, questions came to mind and she was able to ask them. And then she said that even when he was leaving, he was like, what do you need from me right now? And again, she was not used to anyone asking that question. And he was like, I'm gonna wait. And he wait right there. And then she told him what she needed. So it's just as whatever, whoever comes in contact with that patient needs to be aware that they're human, they're going through things. They, and they, and the women tell, told me how they focus on the physical. They never look at the mental piece of them. They never look at their spirituality or that what emotions are they going through? Are they anxious? Are they scared? They felt like that wasn't ever a part of their care. Just more, you know, just look at the physical parts that could heal, but I'm going through something I'm not easily going to heal from. So, but I share that with all providers because anyone who comes in contact, even that person at the front desk, and I, I always bring them up when I present because we know how many of you go in for your appointment, they don't even look up at you. When they do, insurance card, please. And they don't even know want to know your name yet because they'll look at your card and see what your name is. So it's like, it starts at the front desk. So every anyone who comes in contact with the patient, I share this work with. Even people working in the community, they need to just know how it is when we show up in the healthcare system. And, and I think that the challenge I find sometimes is that people are like, I don't want anyone to look at me and see I'm not doing the right thing. And it's not about that, it's about whoever you are, just be aware of how you look in front of that patient. You have your implicit biases showing. You may think that, because a lot of times we, they say that we don't know, but the patient knows. They're like, they just said that to me? You know, so they, they see it. So, but anyways, for anyone, even starting as students, when you interact with a patient, just think about how you appear to them. Nurses are the most trusted, but most trusted in which communities? So you have to earn that trust nowadays. It's not automatic like it used to be back in the day. Now we're starting to see the disparities in care. And some patients are demanding more, but other patients are just shutting down and trying to get through what they have to get through to survive. Yes. Oh. Janet, oh, did you have a question yeah. online? Janet Williams, if you have a question, you can actually ask it. I unmuted you. Maybe not. Hi, this is Janet Williams. Um, I just wanted to say, Dr. Oh, Kenty, that was an excellent presentation. Um, this is such important information that you've given. And I wish I could have been there in person, but this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just going to go here first really quickly, and then we'll go to you. Okay. Um, a comment and then a question. Um, blessed to be a Penn State grad from ages ago. Um, Becky and I work here in the community for a program called Nurse Family Partnership. Therefore, we are kindred spirits. Um, however, do you have any suggestions for us when we are interacting with a new client who is of color? Our philosophies of our programs have all of those things put into place but occasionally it doesn't come intuitively or things that we could share with our other um, younger nurses. And I think for the, the student nurses as well, is there a best way to approach the disparity or to let them know that, no, we haven't lived it, but we are aware and have studied? And very important question and one that I hear a lot. 
when you're meeting someone for the first time, but please keep in mind that there are traumas that communities of color have experienced. And even the trauma could come from a situation you had nothing to do with. But when you're in, when you encounter them, they bring that with them. Because a lot of times, um, some of the trauma we experience, and again, it could be whether you're going in and you tell someone your symptom and they're like, no, nothing's wrong. And then later you find out you have pneumonia or something more serious. So they want to be able to trust. And that's the key thing. And just keep in mind, sometimes that initial encounter, they're, they're filling you out. So they may not open up. But I think the most important thing that I've heard people tell me is they want you to keep showing up and they're watching your actions. So that's the important, the key to it. And even if things start out rocky, doesn't mean that it can't be repaired, but give them space to talk. And they'll say, well, the last person I saw, and then acknowledge that, you know, they'll say they did this to me, that to me. Oh, I understand that happened. You know, what can I do now? What is it that you need now? Because we want to make sure that's not our philosophy and we want to make sure it's not practice. But most people, when they can get it out and let someone know what happened, and if you were like, oh, don't worry about that, you know, it's, that's, you know that's back in the past, they're going to say they don't really care about who I am. And they're not going to buy into anything that you have to give. Even if it's something that's life altering for them or important for them, they will reject it if they see that you're not connecting with them. But give them the space to talk. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kante. Um, I'm glad to be here, actually. I've followed up a lot of your programs, and I really enjoy what you're doing. Thank you. you and Dr. Shield, um, thank you so much. So I have a question. Yeah. How can the research findings be disseminated to benefit uh, the wider healthcare community? Yes. Because what you're doing is a great job. I, I just imagine, how can this go viral, I mean, get to yeah. a lot of places that people would emulate your work? and implement it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. And that's one of the challenges that um, scholars of color experience. Sometimes we feel like our work may not fit a certain journal or a certain presentation, a certain conference, but we have to be put into those spaces. Um, and we have to be, we have to have someone reviewing who understands. And there are journals that are trying to diversify their editorial board. They're trying to do better at conferences. They have a long way to go. And some of them even need support in how to do it because they may have, I want to diversify. And then the scholars of color show up and they felt, feel like they're invisible. So it's just important for us to be in these spaces because those are the ones who are teaching, who are doing the research and they need to hear what we're learning and understanding from our own communities. So it's a big um, barrier to get over, but I think that we just have to keep showing up in certain spaces and bringing colleagues with me. I'm going to Vermont next month, and I've never been to Vermont. I was like looking for different people. Can you want to come? You want to come? And I even encouraged them to do their presentation or a poster. So I have at least four colleagues of mine that are coming up as well to present. So it's just, again, opening those um, opportunities up to other people and letting them see. And if organizations are, I went to an organization that said that uh, a conference that they were looking at um, dismantling kind of racism but there were very few people of color. So how do you make changes when there's no one from the communities that can also share their research and their work? And we just have to bring that to a light as well. Okay, but thank so you for that question. I'm gonna ask a question from Dr. Monique Howard online. So from an advocacy perspective, should there be a movement to deem all black and brown pregnancy as high risk? That will call for a different response from the healthcare system. Okay, that's a good question. Thank you, Dr. Howard. So my thing is that we can't be looked at as a disease. So that's my main concern, because a lot of this is that we're looking at the bird and we're not looking at the healthcare system. And so I think that when you have someone in, but again, like there are women who aren't getting the standards of care. And I'll give you an example to, of that. There was a young lady, she had her baby and she, um, started to not, she didn't feel right, but she couldn't describe it. And when she called her provider, they said, oh, just rest, you have an appointment in two days. When she went to the appointment, her blood pressure was so high, she couldn't, she had to take the ambulance to the hospital. So my thing is that we have to, and, and I just even wanna back up, every person who enters healthcare should get the highest quality of care. Everyone, like what one woman in my study said, I wanna be, I wanna feel important. 
I want them to see that I'm in front of them and I chose to come to them. I want them to value that. So I think that I wouldn't say to make us all look like a high risk pregnancy, but I would say to make sure that we receive quality health care. And if we don't, like that, those stories and this woman, I have to, I didn't even finish the story with her. She ended up having to have an emergency cesarean and then they want her to discharge her home. She couldn't even feel her legs. Her legs were still numb from the anesthesia. And so um, she, she started to get the word out. I was on Twitter. I was like, who works at that hospital? And people started advocating and then they decide to keep her and they had to keep her a couple of days and her blood pressure wasn't even controlled yet. So I just say like, just give and anyone who comes in, we all know how to assess blood pressure, assess blood pressure. We know preeclampsia, very serious condition that impacts, a lot of people think it's just blood pressure. It impacts the heart, the kidneys, everything. So knowing that someone has a headache, that's a classic sign, have them come in. If their blood pressure is good, then that's good. They're okay, that's good. And don't make them feel like you're waste, they're wasting your time. Give them the, the same respect that you would want if you were in the healthcare system. If that was your family member, how would you want them to be treated? Evaluate them properly. And then if they're good, then you can send them home. But let them know that you assess them properly before they left. So they leave and they have a stroke. You're like, well, um, I didn't do this. Or maybe she should have had this or she didn't say this. That's unacceptable to me. So everybody should receive quality health care. And because I, when I come in, I don't want you to be like, oh, she's black, she's a disease. So we got to be, you know, do all these extra things. I want you to do what you feel is right to give me the best care possible. So a comment from um, one of our students on, at Penn State Barron, as a young African-American female, I've already experienced some of the racial aspects going to doctors. But my question is, how many years of schooling did you do? And what was the most challenging and rewarding part of your career? I'm adamant about women's health and plan to follow my great grandmother's footsteps into midwifery. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I love midwives. I love midwifery history. I would have to say that I think every aspect was challenging, but I still kept moving. And so um, undergrad, I didn't see any professors that looked like me for clinical or anything. And for and now looking back, I wish I read some books that were published at the time about the history of black nurses that I learned about indigenous nurses or Hispanic nurses. I wish there was more variety because I think that's hard and that's very lonely for students. Um, when I went to into midwifery, I only had one black professor who was advisor to me and I had one black professor in clinical. No other faculty of color, no other clinical instructors of color, but they gave me support. So what I learned going through, especially when I went for my PhD, is you have to have a community of support. So no, you might be the only one. I've been in classes where I was the only one. I'm like, I'm smart, but I'm not that smart. I know somebody smarter than me out there. So we are out here. So look for a community. That's why I'm joining organizations, because a lot of times we know the struggle. So when, and I, I do provide support to students. I provide support, whether they're undergrad all the way up to graduate. So the most challenging thing I would say happened when I was in my doctoral program. And because I was still kind of searching for what I wanted and I didn't have the right support to help find out what I needed. A lot of it, I found out on my own. You know, I did have, I have to admit, I did have one professor, uh, a white professor, Dr. Peggy Chin. And she was the first one to introduce me to black nursing scholars. All my years of education, I've never knew that was a thing. So, but just her, she opened up a whole new world for me. She doesn't even realize that. The other thing is that I did experience a racist situation when I was a student, a PhD student. I finally realized that I want to look at black maternal health and I wanted to interview women who had severe complications. And I was on an online forum and this was for Dr. Peggy Chin's class. And someone in the um, discussion, I said, you know, I, I found out this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna interview women who had comp severe complications, black women who had severe complications. And a classmate put in the chat, I'm tired of people playing the victim. And went on to talk about how one of her ancestors came here all alone when she was 16 and really just tried to devalue my research. And I was feeling good about myself. And I, I read that, that post, my hair, if you put an egg on my head, it would have fried. I was heated, but I was like, don't answer her. Wait until you, I, I wanted to wait and calm down before I replied. But my professor already replied and said, this is wrong. And that was the first time that any 
white faculty ever stood up for me. And, and she ended up, and it wasn't just a one, let's talk about it today and we're done. She kept bringing it up and saying how it was important to think about race when you did research, to think about racism. But she really empowered me. But so your yeah, community can come up from, from, from anyone. And sometimes you have to be open to that. Sometimes you do trust people, and this is where I had some difficulties. You trust people and they let you down. But just keep in mind, it doesn't have to be that way. Right. Does anyone else have a question right here in the audience? Pull off, right here. Raise your hand. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a question about like educating nurses. So even at Penn State, um, I feel like our textbooks, like you mentioned, never have anything about people of color or other ethnicities. And what should we do as nurses to mm -hmm. further educate ourselves on like, especially like skin conditions and stuff like that? Yes, yes. And that is so, so important. And we first, we have to have these conversations. That's the number one thing. And I feel as faculty, we have a responsibility to know the books that we're bringing to our class. And I just want to share just a really quick story on that to show how you have to accept responsibility. So I was teaching community health nursing and this textbook, it was updated. They had a nice section on, on racism and being anti-racist. And I loved it. But for one of the classes, we were talking about the immigrant population. And there was a term there, illegal alien. And I remember my friend, close friend from Haiti, she was like, when I was young, that word used to traumatize me. And so I was like, I chose this book that's using, even though it is in our judicial system, it's still a harmful word to help tell any human being they're illegal alien. But I, I read that because I have to, before I, and I couldn't read the whole, because I had a short period of time, but I made sure before that class, I read it so that I knew what my students were reading. And when I saw that, I was like, no, and I wasn't going to pretend like I couldn't see it. So I brought it up in my class and it turned out in the class, there were several first generation um, people, immigrants that were in the class. And so they were like, you know, they started talking about how they heard that word and they never liked it, but it opened up an opportunity to talk. But I think that the first thing is as faculty, we have to do better in what we present to you because you shouldn't be coming to us telling us we should already know. So that's the most, that's an important thing. The other piece is that for myself, I had to get outside of the nursing textbooks. Even when I was working on my doctorate, trying to understand black maternal health, because I was told that black women were poor. They, um, they didn't get prenatal care. So all these things, and I was like, this doesn't make sense to those I care for. So I went outside of our nursing books and I started, I even just Googled online black maternal health and a whole area opened up with researchers. So it's, a, it's and that was my, the start for me. So I had to, I looked up those researchers online and then I started looking up their works and was able to find it. And if you go to any faculty member, you may have access to do searches, but sometimes it's hard to do a search for what you're looking for. But even if you go to the library, there's people who can help you find certain ter search terms so that you can find the research that you're looking at. So you can learn about what's important in your community. So unfortunately, we have to get outside the textbook. And I always say there's nothing like going in the community. And I do want to say that one of the, I did a uh, we did a community baby shower in New Britain, Connecticut, and the local school, the nursing program from Central Connecticut State University, they approached me and they said, we know black maternal health is an issue. How can we get involved? So they basically took over the baby shower. They started reaching out to community contacts. They volunteered and it was their way of learning what's in the community. And then they were there for the event. So they were really immersed in it. And you could even see the pride they had in being a part of that. But they had to learn how to, how do I talk to people in the community? How do I find out the resources? So that was all part of it. So we need more things where you can be in the community and learn for what's happening in the community. So from a student at our Scranton campus, says, thank you for your presentation. Just one question. As a student nurse, how can I be uh, effectively ally and advocate for women of color in the healthcare system? Mm, I love that question because anyone could be a part of addressing this issue, anyone. And it all starts first with evaluating yourself. What do you know about yourself when it comes to looking at race? What do you know about yourself with certain communities? 
And I, I, sh I share that because I know that there's a, when I go out and I do talks, there are people who will say, you know, I want to do something and, or I tried to do this and it didn't work, but it's because they didn't start with looking at themselves first. And what is it that I know? What do I need to know? So the more you educate yourself, the more you're able to help your classmates and your other colleagues. Please don't go up to someone black and say, what is it like to be black in America? You're gonna be asking for trouble. Find some books and learn and read yourself and then have conversations where you're also not going in like you're going in that to save them. You're going in to be a, a ally. You're, you're in to be a, a part of the team. You're not leading the team yet. So be a part of the team and let people of color talk. I'm telling you as someone in this space, I still encounter people that they're good intentioned, but they don't know anything about the community. I, there are people who wanna do address maternal health and I'll work with you, but they don't even talk to anyone black. And then they wanna tell me how to show up in this space and that's not gonna happen. So just educate yourself first and be humble and just sometimes just listen. Sometimes just go in without an opinion and just say, can you tell me about this? I wanna learn more and then just listen. And sometimes that's hard for us, especially as nurses, because we're supposed to know everything, but we don't. <laughs> so, but when you, everything that I learned about culture and I'm still learning, I'm not saying I'm done yet. I learned from my patients. I learned from sitting with them, talking with them, asking them their thoughts. So I think if you want to be an ally, educate yourself. And again, let people who are from the community talk and let you know what's happening. Don't go in saying, I know this and you are, you're not ready yet. So Dr. Cynthia Samuel had a question. Um, first is Dr. Canty is a most insightful presentation as a high school nurse. Can you further elaborate on how best we can support our pregnant students, especially those who are LGBTQ students that have been neglected and those dragged through the system? Mm. We need to create spaces in our healthcare system where they feel comfortable and they feel valued. I think it starts there. And I think it does go back to educating and see what the needs are. And for myself, when I'm doing something, I want the community to come first. So getting together with them and asking them what their needs are, whether it's the pregnant teens or those from the um, LGBTQ community. So making sure they have a space, again, to tell you what their needs are. And when I, um, I did a, pregnant, a teen pregnancy prevention program years ago, and everyone's thinking, oh, let's just talk about birth control. Let's talk about STDs. Let's show them pictures of STDs so they could get be afraid. Let's show them a video of a baby crying so they don't get pregnant. But when we went into the community and asked what their needs are, they wanted help with study skills. They wanted someone to talk to them about going to college. How do they prepare? What courses they take? That was what was important to them. It's a lot of times when they have certain goals, it does, not to say pregnancy can happen to anyone, Unplanned pregnancy, I've seen people with their PhDs have an unplanned pregnancy, so it can happen to anyone. But for our younger people, and I, I'm just even to back up a little bit, is that we're all sexual beings. So the most important thing, and again, how that shows up for us is different for everyone. But for me as a provider, my, the most important thing to me is that they're not engaging in something that they don't want to be engaged in, that they're experiencing any type of sexual violence. So what do I do to try to understand what it is they need? I start by talking to them and asking them. And just letting, again, it goes back to being seen and being heard and their experience being valued. So I have a question that I've, I've wanted to ask you for quite some time. So if you turn around, you will see oh. one of the very <laughs> first uh, paintings that I saw of you that um, really uh, attracted me to your work. Explain and share with us yeah. how your experience as not only a Black nurse, but a Black artist, and how do you use your artistry as part of your advocacy? And tell us about this painting. Yeah, so, so my work, so I've always liked art. I've done a little bit, but when you're a nursing student, you don't have time for a lot of Gen Eds, a lot of, I should say, electives. And art and poetry were always something that was important to me. 
poetry was a way that I can talk about my experiences and what I was going through and maternal and pregnancy, uh, maternal health, I was able to use through the arts. So when I did my dissertation, I was able to use artwork to represent my themes. And that's where it originated from. And so when I show art, I'm able to talk about it. And it helps us talk about sometimes uncomfortable um, issues. So this picture right here, and this is, uh, I, th I think I titled it um, Black Mamas Fighting or something, <laughs> something like Fighting for Maternal Health Equity, because I felt like that was what my work has become. That what I found was that people want to learn and want to understand when I'm looking at the woman who's pregnant, she wants to advocate for herself and stand up for herself. As a provider, I want to make sure that she has spaces where she's safe to do that. So I felt like together we were fighting for just, just to be treated with respect and dignity when we go in for care. So that's why a lot of my artwork, there's one picture I have that um, is very, is dark and it represents the uncertainty, but most of my artwork really just shows the beauty of being pregnant, of being really black and pregnant. And I have to tell you, hair was very is very important in my pictures <laughs> because we don't often get the opportunity to express how we you know who we are and our hair is one way to do that so I always make my friends she was like the first thing I saw was the hair and because I want people to just recognize that that's a part of us but it's also a beautiful part of us and so every artwork you'll see that I have different um, types of hair as well thank you any other questions in the audience Do we? Oh, okay. oh yes. I, saw that. I, I went a different way mm -hmm. and I hope it's okay. When I saw that, I went to the typical narrative of the muses, but I took it as I wanted those women in those pictures to inspire me to do better and take their strength and their stories and their power and pull it through me at this stage in my life and do better for the women I have the privilege of helping. So I took it a little, I wasn't completely, I, I wasn't completely off the mark, but I went a slightly given my reality, but I saw strong, powerful women that I wanted to guide me, if that helps at all. Yes, yes. No, it, I love it. I love it. And that's the thing about art is that, and I use, I do use art to have discussions around it. I actually did a presentation. Um, it was virtual and I showed the artwork and asked the women what they thought about it. And I had a colleague, she was writing down what they were saying and she made it into a poem. So we, cause we know that how people look at art is different, but still important. Thank you for that. And I saw somewhere you, you titled this one, Justice for Black Mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> that 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 was the title that you had on your LinkedIn yes. okay, yes. uh, post where where we nabbed the pitch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did get permission to show it. Uh, anyone else? Um, anybody else online has a question for Dr. Conti as we bring the uh, presentation to a close? Or any last burning question here in the audience? And I just want to say two things. Right oh, we have a question, but I just want to thank everyone for coming. Hi, Dr. Conti. Um, in one of the questions they had about how black and brown women being a um, risk factor. Yeah, yeah. And you were against that. And I understood why and your reasoning was good. Yeah. But there's the other extreme now that I know when medical students or even residents are presenting to the attending, they don't mention race at all because they don't want biases, which I understand, but I do want people to start thinking about that. Yes. And I yes. think that's important. So where yes. do you fit in in that? Yeah, no, and I think, I just want, I don't want that to be the defining factor. Cause sometimes when you're like, oh, it's a black woman, people start to think she's complaining, she's gonna exaggerate her pain, like what comes with that. So I kind of understand why they wanna take that out, but I think it's really important for the person caring for them to keep that in mind because sometimes even that person caring whether it's the resident sometimes like that bias creeps in and because we don't talk about it it does influence care and it could be how long they're evaluated if they're evaluated at all because someone coming in with a headache for example and their blood pressure is elevated it may not be extremely high but do labs to check their liver their kidneys do things what are you going to do to rule out preeclampsia 
I've, I've heard of, and this came from a midwife student, I won't say the university, but how patients were dismissed and they were discharged without evaluation. Not even, because I learned that when you're, you want to assess the liver, you're checking for epigastric pain, put your hand on the patient's abdomen. They're not even doing that. So I, I think that, again, we have to go back to if this person comes in, how do I, re how do I rule out preeclampsia? How do I make sure that she's safe to come when she comes in? So, yeah. True, but I, I feel like we're not there yet for Black women. Like when we have pregnant women, 40 and above, precious baby, we know that we are going mm -hmm. to manage them very carefully. That's what I want to see for Black women. And yes, yes, once we've gone to the point that we treat everyone like that, yes, that's okay. But I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, no, we're definitely not there because the numbers keep rising. Exactly. But it starts with, when I look at maternal mortality, I look at how people are valued in the society. And Black women are not valued. I can tell you that as someone with her PhD that went to Yale in Columbia, when I enter those doors for healthcare, I even have the person at the front desk trying to tell me a diagnosis. You know, everyone feels like they know more than what I know. And they don't allow me to, they don't um, let me trust that I understand what's happening to my body. And I think it goes back to there, but that's the thing is that is embedded so deep. That's why I'm saying we have to look at our textbooks because from the very beginning, you can look at any, any textbook from foundations to med surge, maternal health, pediatrics, we're absent, even the way, like you mentioned skin, right? Did you mention skin? And there was a student, because this is such an important question. There was a student who, um, when I did a talk, Overdue Reckoning, and the student said that there were no pictures of people of color at all in her pathopharmacology, a pathophysiology textbook, not one picture of a person of color, that when she had eczema, she didn't even know, it got so severe, the doctor was like, this is eczema. She was like, but when I, my textbook, eczema doesn't look like this. So she didn't even know on her own body. So we're already sending a message. And the professor was in, the, in this group when we talked about this. She went home and looked through every, there was like a thousand pages. She was like, I know there's one picture. <laughs> and she did not find one. But what this professor did was she went online. She said, I had to Google. So I found pictures of other conditions. But I, I share that because when we're absent in the textbooks, People don't know how to interact with us when they see us in real life. They'll go by what they see on television. There was a time, I and Love, Law & Order was my favorite TV show, but I was like, people of color look kind of crazy in Law & Order, so I can't even watch the reruns anymore. But I share that because if we're not educating them on how to evaluate people and see them as human, they're going to be educated through TV, through the media, through Facebook, through Twitter, things that are going to give a distorted view. But it starts with, and that's why when I present, I'm uplifting Black women. I uplift all women, and women will tell you, anyone that comes in for care, I'm going to give them the best care with what I have possible. But that's because I know that other side of being the Black woman that's not seen or heard, that someone spends two minutes on you, and then they want to write your prescription. Or you ask for something, and they're like, oh, you don't need that. And they just, they're dismissive. So I know what that's like. But it starts with saying that each and every one of us is valued, is, is supposed to be valued in this community, because each and every one of us in this room can have something to contribute to health care. It doesn't matter if we're all straight A's. I know some people are going to say, no, don't say that. But I've seen some straight A students not know how to give a shot. And I've seen that student that everybody is like, we got to watch that student. She's trouble. And I've seen her go in and give a shot and provide care that that patient has never received in their life. And she passes the NCLEX on the first try. So, so anyways, I just say that we all have something to contribute, but if we're not valuing each other enough to make sure that in our lecture, we're talking about people and showing, and, and again, not always showing us as a disease because someone found a textbook that talked about malnutrition and it was a black child. The only picture of someone black is in the book was a black child who's malnutrition. So just think about those messages that it sends. So that's why I just say that, all, and again, I, I highlight Black women, immigrant women, Hispanic women. We all need to be uplifted because we're human. But when we go into the healthcare system, if we're not teaching students how to prepare for it, the patient's going to leave without getting the care that they need. Because a lot of things that really make up who I am as a Black woman, if you ignore that, then you're ignoring me.
and you're saying I'm not important and that sends the wrong message. Thank I hope you. that helps. So I'm going to give Dr. Conte the very last word. And if you turn around again and you look, I want you to share with us as we end, um, how can we support your work? I know that Lucinda's House is a very important personal initiative of yours. Yes, yes. Tell us how we can help. Oh, so um, so everything that I do, like any donations goes directly to the community. So there are so many levels where we need help. One is just being able to supply women with the basic needs to care for themselves and their babies. The other thing that um, I need uh, that support helps with is I've had um, students volunteer to find out health information to help me put it on the website. Um, Cause it is a little overwhelming, even the calendar, I need to update my calendar. So don't go to the event section yet. Well, give me a couple days, but, but if there's so many ways that you can help. And the other thing is you can do things in your own community. What I have been doing is even just doing virtual talks about health issues. So if there's something you wanna do in the area and you wanna talk about whether it's birth control, well, women exams, pregnancy, I'm gonna be doing something on um, complications of pregnancy, but I also was asked about infertility and also perinatal loss. So, but if there's topics that you want to know about, you could visit the website that also provides more information on what, and I should have had the QR code there, I forgot to put it on, but it just provides um, background about what we're doing, what, again, what, when I update it, what's coming up, but I also have resources for education. And if you ever find it like a book, um, I have a section on perinatal loss. And there was a new book that came out that someone shared on Twitter. So I took that and I added that to my book library. So just think of ways that you would, um, that are ways to educate the community. If you want to do work, I know Connecticut is far, but you're welcome to come to Connecticut too, or the Western Mass area. But there's also things again that you can do here. And even if you're like, I don't wanna work in maternity, but it's still, again, it could show up wherever you work. So just make sure that you're aware of that and that you're somehow just contributing to improving maternal health. And what's the website? Um, lucindashouse.org. Okay. Please, audience, join me in thanking Dr. Lucinda Canty for an absolutely wonderful presentation. Yes, thank you. For those of you online, uh, we, we had over 150 people at one point. Thank you for joining us. You all will receive a copy of the presentation with the slides. Um, it was recorded, so we'll also have that available on the college's uh, DEI uh, website uh, in an archive uh, so that people can actually view the presentation again. Um, again, on behalf of the Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing, we thank you all for joining us today for the second annual Gunther Gooding DEI uh, lecture series. For those of you who have a little time, Dr. Conti will be available immediately after. And we are also, uh, our colleagues in the PRCC are, are going to have a reception at starting at one o'clock. Uh, so she'll be available there as well if you want to continue to have a discussion with her. Again, thank you. And everybody, please enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, Dr. Fields, one yeah. um, for anyone who's who's taking the two classes that have rosters out here, if you all can kindly stop and quickly provide your, your Jane or John Hancock on that for your professor, that would be great. That way they can um they can mark you as having attended in person. Thank you. Continuing ed was done at that. You'll get an email. If you register, you'll get an email uh, to the um, evaluation. She doesn't care to be there. Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. Canty says she's going to reach out to you. Everybody, goodbye online. <laughs>